Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with my wife and I today as we record this sermon message in our living room to share with you. It's a special time of year, as you know. It's the time of the birth of Jesus. That's the day on the 25th that we, as a church, celebrate the birth of Jesus. And it's a time of joy and peace and the love of God is expressed. Today's title is The Birth of Jesus. It makes it a special time. Uh, the coming of God into the world, uh, bringing the light of God into our darkness, giving us hope when we had no hope. Uh, this is the God that we love and serve because He sent His Son to us, it's our Father. This is Father God's love who sent Jesus to us to save us and not to condemn us. Well, Jesus was prophesied to be born of a virgin woman from the lineage of King David in the town of Bethlehem. Now we're going to be looking at those prophecies then we're going to be seeing those prophecies come to pass in real time in their day. Before we do that, please join with me in prayer as we pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. He's our hope, He's our life, He's our light. He gives us a meaning for being. Relationship with God is something that's possible, it's new, but it's real. And it's happened because our Father sent you to us and He's reconciled us to you through your death and your resurrection. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. And we ask and pray your inspiration and guidance and direction with this message. We thank you for it. And it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus that we pray and all together we say, Amen. Well, let us begin with a couple of prophecies then in Isaiah. Uh, if you'll turn to the book of Isaiah, I'm reading from the NIV version. And um, reading along in the scriptures helps uh, us understand the message a little more uh, fully. So please join with me in Isaiah, the uh, seventh chapter and verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, here now the house of David is not enough. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, in verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, and that would be Mary, and give birth to a son, and he will, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so that was what happened uh, in Luke, the second chapter. So that was a prophecy, you know, thousands of years before Jesus was born. Over also in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, in verse 6, Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says this about being of the lineage of King David and sitting on his throne. Isaiah 9, 6, and for us a child is born, so a baby is going to be born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end, he will reign on David's throne. Uh, and not only because he was born in Bethlehem, but because he was, and is, Lord of Lords and King of Kings over all of creation and over all the universe. And over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever. So once the kingdom of heaven was set up, or the kingdom of light, as it's also called, that would reign for eternity. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, God's will is this, our Father's will. Jesus came to fulfill our Father's will. The Holy Spirit is given to us so we can walk with Jesus 
in the fulfilling of His will, the will of our Father that this kingdom will last for all eternity. Even in the new heavens and new earth, this kingdom will be in place so we can have that hope and assurance that the will of God will be done and has been done by Jesus Himself. And He wants us to join with Him in that today. Okay, let's go to Micah, the fifth chapter now, talking about Bethlehem. Micah, the fifth chapter, and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So it was an older city from ancient times. It was a small city because the clan of King David was smaller than some of the tribes. But out of Bethlehem would come this king over Israel. And therefore the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And uh, that was well known among the biblical scholars, but all the biblical scholars in Jesus' day missed all these points that we're looking at right now. And they were totally out of touch with what true prophecy was happening. Because when we're not in God's spirit, it's hard, if not impossible, to understand spiritual things. So that's where they were. And so who was the one that is going to be shown these things? Well, the lowly shepherd. Was doing what they always did, but they had an open heart. And they were shown the glory of God. But let's be, go to uh, get Galatians. Uh, as far as timing is concerned, uh, Galatians 4. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Um, and we want to go to Galatians 4 and verse 4. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the set time had fully come. So you see, there was a set time. Things had to fall into place for all these things to happen the way that they were given to us through the prophets to see and to know. But when that time had come, the Holy Spirit went to Mary and impregnated Mary. God impregnated Mary. That's why the Son of God, Jesus, was born of Mary a virgin. When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, the law of Moses, that we might receive adoption to sonship. In other, be, in other words, be reconciled by God to God, by Jesus to our Father. Uh, we would be reconciled to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. It's a very close relationship, Abba is, and that's the kind of relationship we have with our Father. And a lot of times in human fathers and sons, that is missing. But with our Heavenly Father, we will know it beyond doubt how close and intimate our relationship is with Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. You are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And that's why Jesus is sharing his inheritance with us. As it says in Romans the 8th chapter. God's love is amazing. We think, well, what about now? Well, we may not have all that we would desire to have now in this life, but we have all we need if we look to God in Christ. God always answers prayer. We have need of something, we ask Jesus for it, and He says, I will give it to you. I'll provide it for you. Now we think, oh, it's going to come in the money in the mail or something of that nature. Well, that isn't necessarily how God is going to work this. 
God is God and God provides. That's what we need to know and understand. So, at the appropriate time, God moved just like he said he would. So God inspired Caesar Augustus to call for a census to be taken where everyone had to go to their ancestral home. And this took Joseph to Bethlehem. Let's notice that over in Luke, the second chapter. Now can you imagine that God used a, a Caesar, someone who worshipped himself, <laughs> to work out his plan for Jesus to be born? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It really is amazing. And so uh, we, go, we come to Luke, the second chapter, in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So for God's plan to happen in Bethlehem, he covered the entire Roman world to have a census. And here, the smallest part of that Roman world was the focus. And this was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria. See, so it even pinpointed more exactly when the time was. And everyone went to their own town to register, which included Joseph. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So, there they are. They're in Bethlehem, but there's not any room in Bethlehem. All the inns are full. But there is a stable. That one innkeeper said, you can use that. And it had a manger. And so this is where Jesus was going to be born. And uh, we have uh, the Lamb of God being born. The Lamb of God who was going to be the Passover sacrifice in um, 31 AD. The Passover sacrifice to forgive the sins of the whole world. And besides that, being born in a manger shows he's going to be a shepherd, a shepherd of the people Israel and the people of the world after that. Uh, all the Gentile world, which is most of the world. So isn't it amazing how God in the symbolism that he gives to us, how thorough he is in communicating with us what's going on. So in verse 6 it says, Well, they were there the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn a son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And uh, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night like they always do. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, because the glory of the Lord was so bright and brilliant, it just stood us, pushed them back. And you and I would have been terrified as well. This is abnormal. This is out of bounds. But it was the glory of God that those angels showed to them, the shepherds. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So him not being born in a lodge room was no accident. It was designed by God to be that way. How else would you choose a manger? We wouldn't have chosen a manger. We're wanting better than that for Mary. We're doing everything we can to have it be something else. 
something more suitable for her. And yet the most suitable thing for her was exactly what she received. So suddenly, in verse 13, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And if we understood properly, we'd realize that his favor rests on all of us in Jesus. It's just that some of us don't look and we don't see, and therefore we don't understand. But it's there. It's there for everybody to look and everybody to see. But the devil doesn't want anybody to see, so he blinds our eyes and gets us all distracted in all manner of things so we can't see the most glorious thing that's ever happened on the face of the earth up to this time. So in verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, ah, that was interesting. No, they didn't say that. They said, let's go to Bethlehem. <laughs> That's what they said. They were told where it was they needed to go to see this child and that's what they wanted to do. So we can be thankful for the shepherds and their humility to hear the word of the angel and to then respond to it positively. And that's what we need to do today when the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder. He says, hey, you need to go here or there or do this or that for God's glory. So let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word. So they became the first evangelist ever concerning Jesus. Well, I guess John the Baptist was, uh, well, he wasn't but a babe yet either. So they, they still are the first ones. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it exactly like that before. But yes, they were the first evangelists. John the Baptist came along later concerning Jesus. So they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Which she was always doing that, Mary was, always pondering the things that had happened recently in her heart. Bless her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told, which is exactly the way it is with us today when we respond to the things we've been told in the Word and in the Spirit. So we realize, you see, that Jesus has been born and so we realize that this is a wonderful thing. You see, Jesus was born to be our Savior. He is born to be our Shepherd. Let's notice him being our Shepherd over in John the 10th chapter. John 10, verse 1. This is very important for us today, how he's the Shepherd over all of us in the Spirit today. John 10, verse 1. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but it climbs in by some other means as a thief and a robber so there's only one gate to go through and that's Jesus the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought out all his own he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice they have a relationship with the shepherd, the sheep do. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. And that is true in all manner of relationships. And it's especially true in this relationship between Jesus and us. So Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them because they weren't spiritually connected. They telling Jesus he didn't belong there, that he was a, someone who was uh, misrepresenting God. Therefore Jesus said again, very true, I 
Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. In other words, they didn't tell the truth, and they were connected to God in the Spirit. But the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, because he's the way of salvation. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's what we have mostly in our world today, is the devil's mantra of stealing and killing and destroying. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The spirit life in us is much more wonderful than anything else we can possibly imagine because it will go and increase into eternity. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's why he's a good shepherd. He gives his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Hallelujah and Amen. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So that's what He did. He came to lay His life down on the cross and to raise it up again at the resurrection. And that was the will of our Father. Praise God. So Jesus was also the light of the world. Over in John, uh, the first chapter, we see that very clearly over in John, the first chapter. John, the first chapter and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So it goes to show you that Jesus is, was God before He was Jesus. God was the Word, and He became Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made without Him. Nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. God's love is amazing, isn't it? Why would God do this for us, His creation? It is a hard thing to know, except that God loves us so much He would do that. Wow! Amazing, and yet here we want to curse God and kick Him around, blaspheming. It's just horrible. Why would we do that? Well, the devil, that's what the devil wants us to do, and if we're listening to the devil, that's what we're going to do. That's why we need to repent. If we ever have any sense about what's going on, we need to repent of that attitude, for sure. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is the goal for his coming, to have our sins forgiven, to be reconciled to our Father, to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. 
We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just like we would want God to be. Full of grace and truth. In other words, completely full of the love of God. And a humility that astounds us that He would lay His life down like that, in that manner. Amazing, amazing love. So, here we are. What do we make of all this? Where do we go with this personally? What is the conclusion for our action today? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, and see what it says and ask for us to do with such a great truth and reality as this. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 14. For Christ's love, God's love sent us, so Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died as we have talked about. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Amen. Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer because we see the spiritual connection. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God our Father who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So now that we have the Spirit of Christ living in us, we are a new creation. And therefore we say, oh, okay, that makes us the children of our Father. And then our Father tells us, now I want you to go and be with Jesus and participate with Him in His ministry of reconciliation that He has done for you, for you and me. In other words, to give our testimony. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. That's the only way you can reconcile. Sin has to be forgiven. And He's committed to us then the message of reconciliation. Our Father has. Jesus has. The Holy Spirit has. This is our commission. And going to all the world with the Gospel is to teach them about the Gospel, which we've been talking about, which includes being reconciled to our Father, which we cannot have any other way except our sins be forgiven. Hallelujah. Praise God that we are now the children of our Father. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. He wants to, He desires to, He will do that. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Yes, be reconciled to God. That's the story that comes from the birth of Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to God. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God as his holy children. We thank you, dear God for giving us Jesus. We thank you for the birth of Jesus, that we can celebrate it and recognize how it changed world history and made the time go from B.C. to A.D. and changed the way the whole world looks at government and the, the future of the Kingdom of Heaven on earth and in the new heavens and new earth that are prophesied to come. Now we have a responsibility as the children of our Father to go to you, Jesus, and to be your ministers of reconciliation and to have the Holy Spirit tell us the timing of things as to when we should say to people, be reconciled to God. We have a responsibility in a dark world to speak the truth, to speak the wonderful truth of God's love in us. And we ask and pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you'll help us to do that and to share that good news with others 
that the whole world will know that our Father God loves us so much because He wants us to be His children for eternity. We praise you. We thank you. In the blessed and holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.